A very, very warm welcome to another Action for Happiness live event. My name is Mark Williamson, and it's absolutely lovely to see so many of you joining us uh, live from all around the world, as always, and greeting each other in the chat. And I'm really happy you've joined us for today's event on optimizing sleep and delighted to welcome Dr. Narina. Welcome, Narina. Oh, you're muted. We can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, I can't wait to start this conversation. We've got so much to cover and so many people yeah. keen to learn from your amazing insights on, on sleep. But just really quickly, for those of you who are new to these events, uh, Narina and I will have a, a conversation together covering a whole range of topics with optimizing sleep. And you'll have a chance to get involved with some interactive discussions and activities along the way. And then we'll make sure we've got time for all of you to ask questions. Uh, we may not have time to answer all of them, but Narina will happily turn to some of your questions and I'm sure you'll have lots. Um, so please do post your own in the Q&A function and also feel free to vote up anyone else's question that you like the look of. And this whole thing will take about an hour and um, let's dive straight into it. Narina, you are of course uh, really exciting to welcome to this because you bring that sort of scientific rigor and expertise that we love having in action happiness events. But I know you've also dabbled in other things around yeah. different ways of thinking about well-being uh, and, and sleep. Maybe you could say a little bit about your background and why you're so interested in this topic. Okay, so I've been helping people to sleep for over 25 years. I started out in academia, I uh, did a doctorate in neurophysiology, and, um, and then I headed into the city, the London Square Mile, I was working in a health screening laboratory, and that was when I noticed that the subject of sleep was, was becoming relevant. So of course, technology had landed on the scene, everything was speeding up, the pace of life, the level of demand, globalization, and it was having an impact on the physiology of my clients, and I could measure it. Now, when you get your average banker through from Merrill's or Goldman Sachs or whatever and they come through the door for their medical you don't want to be asking them how you feel but I noticed that if I asked them how they slept how did you sleep last night they would open up and they would talk so I started developing uh, this ability to get people to talk about sleep um, I didn't realize that subconsciously it was driven by my own preoccupation with sleep because I was an insomniac I didn't even realize I had sleep problems until I started talking to other people and when I spoke to my mother she said yeah as a baby that's to my 30s I couldn't sleep so I worked in health screening that took me into organizations where I started giving corporate presentations on sleep ended up working at a psychiatric clinic for 10 years wrote my first book tired but wired one shameless plug for that book um, that catapulted me into the limelight ended up doing a bit of tv radio wrote another few books and I've continued you know my work takes me into schools I work with people recovering from cancer um, I've done a bit with Premiership Footballers, Chelsea Football Club. And as you said, it's not just Western science, there's a bit of traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, it's holistic. Wow, what a fantastic track record. And I'm delighted to hear that not only do you have all the sort of clinical and expert experience, but you also have that sort of personal lived experience, because I know there'll be lots of people in the community this evening that are struggling personally, and, and so you can share a bit of personal insight there as well. Why don't we start with the basics, Narina, which is, <laughs> before we dive into what we can do about it, just remind us why sleep is so important. Yeah, good question, Mark. I mean, there's a reason why nature has designed us to spend a third of our lives sleeping. You know, there's an intelligence in that design. And um, I have to say, I've solved my sleep problems now. I sleep beautifully a lot of the time, um, but certainly when we don't sleep well, it can impact on our health on every level, not just physical, but mental, emotional, spiritual, I believe. You know, we wake up feeling uninspired, we lose our creativity, we lose our joie de vivre, happiness, our ability to be happy. So nature has uh, gifted us uh, this physiology whereby we're meant to sleep to replenish and restore ourselves from the exertions of the day and of life. So we wake up with the resilience to do it all over again. And there's an intelligence in that. Yeah, that's really true. And I, I actually really loved what you said about the question you found got people to open up when you were working with those stressed city people. I wonder if we might just turn briefly to our audience and ask them that same question to see how people are, well, what, why don't you word it? How, how would you, what, how yeah, would you ask I mean, I love asking that. Chat? Yeah, how did you all sleep last night? If there was just one word that you could throw into the chat box, how did you sleep last night? Can you remember, oh, we've got, pre I can see them. Oh, Pretty good, uh, poorly, quick. dreadful, awful, like a baby, yep. restful, peaceful, not good, on and off, badly, beautifully, 
fairly uh, early awakened, intermittent, rubbish. I didn't sleep splendidly. So, I mean, already in just those few responses, an amazing yeah. mix of different perspectives. Yeah. So we've got our work cut out for us today, haven't we? So given how important this is, um, well, actually, I, just to make a quick observation, I wonder if you'd agree with this before we move on. It feels to me that knowing that sleep's important, as you've just reminded us, mm. is, is really good. But sometimes that can almost add to our sleep problems. If we're someone who's struggling to sleep, being told it's really important you sleep well may not be all that helpful. What do you, how do you feel about the kind of almost obsession some people now have with wanting yeah, to sleep? Yeah, I mean, it is an obsession. And I, you know, I remember those, those days when I wasn't sleeping well. After a while, I became obsessed as well. I'm trying not to look at all this fascinating stuff that's yeah. coming from the chatbots, you know? It's a lot of 3 a.m., 4 a.m. waking yeah. as well, so we must talk about that. But mm. um, yeah, as, as a, I was gonna say as a nation, but globally, the sleep industry is worth billions of dollars, billions of pounds. And even though, as I said, nature has designed us intelligently, the fact that the world has been changing for the last decades and everything's speeding up and it's the way we're responding to the world. It, it, on one hand, it's a bit of a paradox because while we are fascinated, obsessed with sleep, on the other hand, we don't always give it the respect that it needs. So we take slices off our sleep to try and get stuff done, um, catch up with life, get through the inbox, catch up on Netflix or whatever. So um, yeah. It's, it's a bit of a contradiction in that sense. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, in some ways it's a surprise that considering, as you said, we're designed to sleep, mm. that we're so bad at it. I mean, in your experience, how pervasive is this problem of, you know, people yeah. not being able to sleep well? Because it feels, I mean, just looking at the numbers that have signed up for this event and the thousands that are with us live right now suggests yeah. we haven't really cracked this yet. Yeah, I, I think, well, I've been, as I said, I've been observing this for 25 years plus um, that sleep and I predicted two and a half decades ago that we would be going into an insomnia epidemic and we and we are. And in the last few years with the pandemic, um, sleep problems have risen insomnia and it's kept me busy. I'm making a living out of it, you know, in a slightly parasitic fashion. But um, you know, the way we are responding to life, and this I love the work that you do, and that's one message that I want to get out today, you know, several messages, but we need to start responding to life in a different way. Um, yeah, technology is here and it's amazing, but we could say we're slaves to technology, but we need to rethink that because the way we're responding to the level of demand in our lives and in the world is not helping us to sleep. But there are some really, there are some practical solutions and I'd like to make some inroads today into helping people find those solutions. Yes, so I know you've got this um, five non-negotiables for sleep, so I'm really looking forward to exploring those. But I also have heard you talk about some of the perhaps unhelpful beliefs we have around sleep mm. or the, the myths mm. that get, get um, sort of peddled that may or may not be true. Maybe you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, I, I've been spotting a few coming into the chat function as well, where people have been talking about how many times they woke up. So that's one of the thing, first things I say to people, you know, when I used to work in the psychiatric clinic, you know, the patients would come in and say, I woke at this time and I woke at that time and I woke so many times during the night. And I said, well, well done. So it's normal to wake during the night. The average human being wakes between 10 to 15 times a night. I call this sleep elasticity. So it's a rebounding between deep sleep and wakefulness. If we didn't have this, we would probably be extinct as a species. So we wake up, we become slightly vigilant, we check the cave is safe, we go back to sleep again. So that's normal. The other thing people do is they, they believe that, you know, you can play catch up. So the sleep that you get between say 12 midnight and 8 a.m. is the same as the sleep between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. and that's not the case. So people are going, and this has happened a lot during the pandemic where people have been going to bed later and waking up later because they haven't had to commute or conform to an organizational timetable as strictly. Um, what else? Have you got the waking up during the night? One thing I the... saw on the app today, we have this amazing app community in the arena of Action of Happiness supporters, and many of whom are really looking forward to this conversation. And a few of them were observing how they had been recently falling asleep on the sofa at night uh, yeah. and so on. And that feels to me that it's like with our growing Netflix love and so on that that become is, is that something you're seeing quite widely and is that is that yeah. a good thing no it's not a good thing so what happens um at the moment it's bright it's summer here in the UK so um the light levels are are still pretty high but as the levels of light start to drop below about 200 lux uh it sends a message through the, the eye to the retina 
through to the pineal gland, the circadian timer. And it, it's, with a great degree of precision, we produce this sort of cocktail of neuropeptides and hormones. So we've got factor H, adenosine, uh, then melatonin, the hormone. So what happens when we sit there watching TV at night and we start to get drowsy? It's because it's like a surfer surfing and hitting the sweet spot on a wave. That point of sleep, sleepiness, which I call the sweet spot, is the point at which we should probably start preparing to go to bed rather than using up that beautiful biochemical cocktail, falling asleep in front of the TV, and then you sort of wake up with a jerk, and then you think, right, I need to get to bed. Let me just quickly check my phone. The blue lights overstimulates the, uh, the circadian timer again, and then the combination of depleted hormones and neuropeptides plus the blue light means you can't then get to sleep. Long-winded way of saying, stop falling asleep in front of the TV. Very good advice. So Not a good idea. In a moment, we're going to come on to your advice, but just wanted to ask you about different types of sleeper. You sort of mm. sometimes hear that, you know, some people can sleep through anything. Some people are always a bit restless. How would you describe the sort of way, the, the different styles of sleeper that you see in your practice? So I have my own sort of uh, unique sleep classification based on my extensive um, uh, research and experience. So at one end of the scale, you've got the martini sleeper, I'm showing my age from the cocktail of the 70s that you could drink anytime, any place, anywhere. Okay, so the martini sleeper can sleep anytime, any place, anywhere. They can sleep on a pinhead. They don't know why I've got a job. Um, on the other hand, you have the sensitive sleeper who is exactly as it sounds. Now in, in neuroscience, we call this their neuroceptive abilities. The way their nervous system responds to the world, sights, sounds, smells is very heightened. So sensitive sleepers need their side of the bed. They need their pillow. They would travel with their own blanket or pillow. They can't sleep on an argument. Your martini sleeper will go to bed and say, let's talk about it tomorrow. Um, Kirsten, yes, I am wearing an aura ring. Sorry, that was nearly very rude with my finger there. I am wearing, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on commission. I'm not plugging it, but I get lots of merch, merchandise. Um, but yes, yeah, so on one end you have this, the martini, the other end the sensitive. Why is it useful to know this? Firstly, to navigate your relationship, because if you've got your martini waking up during the night to pee several times and you're sensitive saying, stop getting out of bed, stop telling me the time every time you get out of bed. The sensitive sleeper really needs their, they need all every trick in the book, all the tools I'll talk about. A lot of people during the pandemic who were martini sleepers became more sensitive as a result of you know, loneliness, bereavement, financial worries, fear, illness, you know. But on the other hand, there were multi, um, sensitive sleepers who became more martini-like because we have this connection between safety and sleep. We sleep when we feel safe. And if you're a sensitive sleeper, you might have responded well to working from home because you weren't having to leave your home, your office, you know, you're in your nice cozy home wearing your pajamas. And um, so th there was less stress on the nervous system. So knowing your chronotype or your sleep type and someone saying they sleep so badly in hotel hotels, and that's a classic example. Some people are martini-like, but the minute they get into a hotel, they don't sleep well. Um, and I used I to be like that. I can relate to that one. Yeah. That's a, really a whole toolkit for sleeping in hotels. environment. Let's yeah. just, because you very kindly picked up on a, a question in the chat there, asking about an aura ring. And just for anyone who's not familiar with yeah. that, that's just one of an example of a, a sort of wearable piece of technology that can do things like measuring your sleep as well as other parameters. I, I, I use one as well and find it helpful to understand you know, things that actually help me sleep better, like going to bed earlier, eating less late at night and so on. But I wonder if you could just say a little bit before we come on to your tips about whether it's a healthy thing to be measuring our sleep, because you, yes. I, I wonder if we might get a little bit over paranoid. And, uh, you know, if you, if you measure something too much, you start almost adding extra anxiety. How do you feel about the, the smart watches and the rings generally? Yeah. So I have two measuring devices on at the moment. Again, both gifts. Um, but I don't wear the Fitbit. I wear the Aura Ring because it's really easy. And actually, I am I am taking some very uh, meaningful data away from it. But there's a new form of insomnia that's been included in the DSM manual, which is um, orthosomnia, O-R-T-H-O, somnia, which is the poor sleep that arises as a result of your perfectionistic overthinker overly uh, looking at the data and then worrying that their sleep isn't perfect. Um, or the data just not giving the 
like quite the, the right interpretation. So it says that you've woken so many times during the night. It doesn't say there, there, well done, Mark. You woke several times a night, you're, you're normal. You're human. But it can create, <laughs> you're a human. So for perfectionists, and I, I wonder how many perfectionists we have in, in, in the audience. Okay, I, are you really, Mark? I wouldn't have thought, yeah, right. I know you are. So perfectionists um, will typically have tightness in neck and shoulders. They grind their teeth at night. They might go to bed wearing a mouth guard. It's really attractive. Um, they go to bed within a state of have to do, must do. It's orthosomnia, Alicia. O-R-T-H-O somnia, orthosomnia. So it's a, a poor sleep created by the overmeasurement. Now, take it with a smallish pinch of salt, the data. I wake up in the morning, I think, how am I feeling? How much did I train yesterday? How restorative does my sleep, did my sleep feel? Then I might look at the data and I go, oh, that's interesting. It's saying I need more recovery. And that actually bears out how I'm feeling at the moment. So tune in first before so it's you like tune using in. using technology to complement our natural instinct yes. rather than to make us more paranoid. So let's come on to some of your fantastic sleep tips. I know, I think I've heard you calling them non-negotiables and you've got yeah. five of them. Is that right? Where do we start? What's number one, Marina? Okay, well, can I just set them up yeah, first? Can we set them up? Because okay, everyone's going to go, oh gosh, yes, we've heard that old hat again, right? So <laughs> I have an extensive toolkit which includes things like meditation, breath work, um, all sorts of tree hugging in, is in there as well. But the five non-negotiables are the five things that I, I recommend all of my clients do for at least 10 to 14 days before they go any deeper, working any deeper with their sleep, sleep problems. These are five things. Now, the reason they work is because they reset the nervous system. So where you live in your nervous system will have a direct impact on how you sleep. The reason I'm doing this is the autonomic nervous system controls every physiological system in the body. It's divided into two branches. You've got the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight, trauma, uh, stress, adrenaline, cortisol, caffeine, dopamine hits from your phone can't slow down. A lot of people here were talking about restlessness. That's an indication of an overactive sympathetic nervous system. If you're measuring your sleep and your heart rate variability is very low, that's probably because your sympathetic is too active. Right, the other part of the nervous system is parasympathetic, rest, repair, recovery, digestion, sexual function, immune function, deep sleep. This is where you wanna be living in order to thrive. This is surviving. The five non-negotiables reset the nervous system from surviving into thriving after 10 to 14 days, even when I work with severe cases of insomnia in the psychiatric clinic most of them, okay? Right, so here they are. Long setup, but it's important. Number one, um, eat breakfast within 30 to 45 minutes of rising. If when you wake up, your nervous system is nervous. So when you wake up, if you're thinking, must do this, should do this, have to do this, then I've got my inbox and I've got the kids to school, then I've got them this and I've got them this, eat, 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 don't fast. That's the first one and include a source of protein in that breakfast as well. The second thing is don't use caffeine as a, a substitute for food. Eat first and then have your cup of tea or coffee. You know, if you don't have any sleep problems, by the way, it's, you don't have to be that strict about these things, but this is really for the sensitive sleeper. So don't use caffeine as a substitute for food. Eat first, then you can have a cup of coffee or tea. Ideally no caffeine after three o'clock in the afternoon. Third non-negotiable, aim to drink about two to three liters of water a day preferably some of that alkalized, which you can ask me about in a minute, but two to three liters of water, hydrate the brain, your sleep, um, your sleep biochemistry will work more optimally. And a number of people who talked about menopausal symptoms, perimenopause, restlessness, hydration will make a massive difference. Okay, two to three liters of water. Number four, get to bed earlier for at least four nights a week. So you don't have to be passed out at 9 p.m., but ideally in bed around 10, 10.30, we've got Aisha saying something and I really want to address it, but um, I'll come back to it. Get into bed around 10. You can be reading a book, preferably a book. You know, these are books, old fashioned book, old fashioned book, um, meditating, journaling, but not on your devices. And then preparing to take your, light, your, your lights off between 10, 10.30. Number five, cultivate a healthier relationship with these adorable devices get them out of the bedroom, have an electronic sundown about 60 to 90 minutes before you get into bed. You know, just put them on silent, put them in another room. Don't have them in your bedroom. Get an old fashioned clock. You can still get those on Amazon. I've got one for about eight quid. 
And this is, I'm gonna give another tip. This is a huge tip, Mark. Stop checking the time during the night. Stop checking the time. The single biggest disruption to getting back to sleep, which we have established is totally normal, but people don't get back to sleep because what do they do? They look at the time, they do a subtraction. They then do a risk assessment and they then catastrophize about how awful their lives are and how bad they're gonna feel the next day, particularly if they're a tooth grinding perfectionistic overthinker, you know? Can we I mean, go back to I yeah. Well, I'd love to come to Aisha's point, but I think you've just shared such a lot of wisdom in a, such a, an efficient and compact way. And I just wanna sort of replay that um, to make sure I've taken it in really, because it's so, so powerful. So eating early, especially with a source of protein gets you off to a, yeah. a calmer start trying to avoid using caffeine as a food substitute so you know not too much caffeine and also not as a replacement for a meal being well hydrated um yeah. and you said about that's not just water but potentially water with some electrolytes or some salts or something in it as well going to bed earlier um and then the relationship with technology which is so important i love the tip of an old-fashioned clock i think that's um that's yeah it's something i invested in and i realized the main reason i kept my phone in my bedroom was wanting to check the time and of course we, we were doing that yeah. for years before we or if we even need to before those phones came along um so so what was the point that um was being raised in the chat that you wanted to right so, yeah that? Aisha said she finds it really difficult to eat first thing in the morning and a number of people said that they they find it difficult to eat until midday now I talk about this a lot in my books where um, I describe something called a fatigue cycle so if you are not eating breakfast in the morning but you're waking up with anxiety it's a sign that you're living in your sympathetic nervous system. So basically you're running your body and your brain on cortisol and adrenaline, and you're gonna want coffee. You're gonna want caffeine, which is a similar um, molecular structure to adrenaline actually. It's a similar sort of stimulant effect. But people who don't eat breakfast and wake with anxiety tend to feel sick. If you think about yourself as a child about to do an exam or a race, the last thing you'll think about is wanting to eat because you've, you've got anxiety in, the, in your stomach and it's clenching. So what you need to do is break the cycle because here's a, a very oversimplified physiological connect pattern connection. People who don't eat breakfast and wake up with anxiety produce less melatonin. Let me say that another way. If you wake up with anxiety and you start eating breakfast, breaking the fast, you will produce more melatonin. You will sleep better. So I don't feel anxious, you just don't feel hungry. Of course you don't. It's like saying somebody go to the gym and they've never been to the gym in their life. They're not going to get out of bed going, oh, I really want to go and run a marathon. So if you don't normally do this sort of thing, you're not going to feel like doing it. Red Bull breakfast. I, I see, we need to have a follow up on this. I need to stop looking at this chat function. It's making me very sad. But you've got to break the cycle. The definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same result. So if you're anxious, if you're not sleeping well, and if your life and your, your ability to tap into happiness is in your toenails, you need to change something. Get uncomfortable and eat something small in the morning. It might be as small as eight almonds and two dates. You know, eight walnuts and half a banana or a small glass of protein-based smoothie or something, something small to break the fast. You're making another important point, of course, which is um, lots of the things we talk about with action for happiness about our overall happiness and well-being also contribute to healthier sleeping because if we can be in a calmer more mindful emotional state we're more likely to sleep well um, yeah. I would certainly encourage you to to turn off the chat if you if you'd like to avoid uh, being distracted we're going to come to Q&A in a moment so there'll be lots of a chance for us to respond to questions at that point but just one of the things you said that I think many of us will be interested to learn more about which is this idea of going back to sleep so you've already reminded us really helpfully that we naturally wake up a lot in the night. I've seen people referring to something I struggle with, which is needing the loo in the night, needing to go pee. Uh, people saying that, you know, they might have checked their clock like you said we shouldn't. Mm. What are your tips for, you know, if you do wake up in the night, um, just to sort of be able to get back to yeah. sleep again? Well, let's do something experiential. So let's yeah. just let's recap on that. You wake up during the night. Number one, no, it's normal. Number two don't look at the time and mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, don't touch your phone it, because it'll be in another room, okay? So no, it's normal. You wanna pee, go and pee. Don't lie there thinking, oh God, I'm gonna pee. It's normal, go and pee, just don't make a song and dance about it. Don't put lights on, don't, you know, try and stay sleepy. You know, even if you have to simulate sleepiness. And then I'm, let me take, let's take the audience through 
a ludicrous but powerful way of putting yourself back to sleep. Should, should we do that together? Love to, yeah. It's a bit of madness, but it really works. And it's really good for children who can't sleep as well. Okay. So I'm going to take you to a taster meditation. I, I've got longer versions of this on Amazon Audible, by the way, but I'm going to do a taster of this. Brilliant way to put yourself to sleep or back to sleep. Uh, Mark's falling asleep already. But what I'm going to say some words, and all I want you to do is to repeat them to yourself silently not out loud silently as i say them and it will sound ridiculous but go with it and you repeat them silently to yourself and i'm going to close my eyes now as well and let's go for it okay so following my voice eyes closed and here we go just repeating these words as i say them to yourself silently i love my right foot I love my right big toe. I love all the toes of my right foot. I love my entire right foot. I love my right shin. I love my right calf muscles. I love my right knee. I love my right thigh. Okay, can we open our eyes and come back now? Now, can you see can you see what what we what I've done there? It's you simply bore yourself to sleep, okay? You work your way, someone just nodded off. You work your way up. You could start on your left leg, if you like, your left foot, but it's either the right or the left. Now, can, let me just explain the intelligence in this particular meditation. We're starting with the extremities because when you wake up during the night, the first thing that, that we do is we go straight up into the head and we start thinking. The minute you start saying, I love my foot, whichever, you bring the attention down to the lower extremities, it starts to bring you back into your body. So it's quite embodying. Thank you, Becky, it's brilliant. It's a very embodying experience to do that. The second word thing that I've done that there deliberately is yes, it is based on yoga nidra. It is based on a body scan or progressive muscle relaxation, but more intelligently than that, it is based on um, self-love. The word love is the most safety inducing word in the English dictionary. And a lot of people, when they can't sleep, they go into a state of fear, particularly in this pandemic and post pandemic. So we use the word love, even if we're not feeling loving towards ourselves. And we're thinking that mad woman that love meditation. Well, I'm just going to say it. now what will happen is you will start to fall asleep and you'll it will become nonsensical. I did this this afternoon. Actually, I went for a swim down the river with some of my mates and um, and then I came back and I had a shower, did a bit of work and then had a nap at three o'clock. For 20 minutes, I started this. I went from my toe to my nose in, in seconds. That's because I was dropping down into my nap. So it's a lovely one to use in a power nap. As soon as you fall asleep, this is really important. As soon as you start falling asleep, you might wake up with a jolt thinking, oh, I fell asleep. I'm awake again. Go back to your starting point. I love my right foot. There we go. That's it. It's a form of self hypnosis. Marina, I absolutely love this. I've been using a body scan meditation for years to help me sleep. But actually, as you just said, you've combined that whole idea of sort of gently bringing attention to different parts of your body with a with a self love practice. Which, yeah. as you said, I, in fact, I know. I think your new book's on this subject of safety as well as it, it is. It is what, because what, remind us what that book's called because I'm interested in this concept. It's an absolutely brilliant book. It's over there. Uh, finding inner safety finding inner safety your copy is winging its way over to you mark i, I sent yeah. it off today finding inner safety because i discovered years ago that being able to sleep i mean of course you can get the duvets and the blackout blinds and the pillows and the aromatherapy candles and all of that but fundamentally it's about our relationship with ourselves and it's about feeling safe and it's about living in the right part of your nervous system where you can feel happy, where you can find joy, you can thrive. And if we don't feel safe, we don't sleep. So 25 years ago, I wanted to write Finding Inner Safety, but the publishers weren't commissioning it because they're like, what will people think about safety? And then, of course, we go into the pandemic and everyone's going, ah, I don't feel safe. So the book got commissioned, which was brilliant, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So Finding Inner Safety. 
which is about all of this really. Um, well, I, I, lo I, lo I really love that experiential thing. And maybe we could um, bring in another meditation of yours mm. a bit later in our time together today. But um, another thing that's been on my mind is what we can do during our waking hours, as well as, you know, the, the, the sort of mindfulness around our caffeine and our technology use and so on, to help us sort of stay calm. Because it feels to me that along the lines of lots of our action happiness practices, if we can stay more in that mindful, calm awareness during our day, we're probably also going to have less, or we don't need as much wind down time, maybe at the end of the day. How, how do you sort of stay calm when you're doing a big event like this, for example? What are your techniques to stay calm in the day as well? Okay, um, well, I've prepared, I've had, a, I've had a model day today, so I don't want you to listen to me and think, God, you're so perfect. Um, yeah, today's been a model day. I, I woke up and I just sat up and I meditated straight away. I practiced transcendental meditation, so I did 20 odd minutes of meditation and then um, fed the animals. Sounds like I live on a farm, but I've got two animals, a dog and a cat. So, um, and then I had a small breakfast, my small first breakfast, took the dog out for a run walk, 25 minutes or so, came back, had another breakfast, which was the bigger breakfast, uh, threw myself into some emails, uh, got up every 30, 45 minutes at my age. I need to roll around a lot to keep, to be fit to sit and to do the climbing and stuff that I like doing. Um, went for a swim down the river with some mates at about 11.45, 15 minutes in cold water, came out of it feeling slightly euphoric. It's not that cold at the moment. So, um, and, um, and then what else did I do? A bit more work, post office, chores, bit more work, napping, bit more exercise, another 10 minute dog call. <laughs> it, I oscillate. I build recovery into my day. So I'm not relentlessly sitting at a laptop, you know? So I try and factor, I've done a TED talk on this, um, come to work and rest, it's called, come to work and rest. But every, our energy runs on 60 to 90 minute cycles. You know, people run their energy in such a kind of a relentlessly linear fashion. We're built to recover energy. We're meant to recover every 60 to 90 minutes. So every, every 60 to 90 minutes, I do something that helps me recover. You know, whether it's laugh, have a chat with a friend, hug someone who wants to be hugged, groom the dog. <laughs> Lovely. These are all great actions for happiness. Um, Narina, I want to give lots of time in this event for the questions, because I know lots of people have got mm. you know, things they really want us to address. One of the topics that I've already seen come up both in the Q&A and on the chat, and I know is on people's minds, is about the menopause and how that, well, both generally responses to, to the menopause uh, for our well-being, but also particularly in terms of sleep disruption and, and, and good sleep. How would you like to sort of take us through your insights on, on sleep and menopause? Yeah, the, the menopause is a time where women, uh, you know, changing levels of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, they start to fluctuate and the body then has, um, can develop the predispos predisposition uh, to become oversensitive, we start running on adrenaline and cortisol. So some women might, you know, get their wisely get their hormone levels checked, and they might opt to take hormone replacement therapy or body identical hormones or something like that. But there are also a number of um, holistic lifestyle practices. I mean, it, the menopause and perimenopause is the time to practice radical self care radical, ruthless self-care, because it's the time when that nervous system can really get out of balance. So looking after yourself, getting good new nutri nutrition, and that breakfast thing, by the way, that becomes even more important. So if, you go, if you're perimenopausal or menopausal, don't practice intermittent fasting, particularly if you're putting weight on around the middle. So you want to be getting that breakfast in the morning. Somebody asked, what was my small breakfast this morning? My small breakfast was a boiled egg and a small piece of cheese. Yeah, that was my, my, my tiny break. Well, but you know, I'm, I'm a good eater. I can eat quite a lot as a small breakfast. And then the second breakfast was smoked salmon cream cheese and a piece of bread, you know, and lunch was Greek yogurt and stuff like that. So it, I sort of play with it, but I'm noticing yeah, again, a lot of, um, I'm noticing a lot of kind of protein and healthy fat in those, in those meals. Yeah, meals. nothing low fat. Don't do low fat. You need, we need protein. We need fat. We need carbohydrates as well. So don't, don't go on keto as well if you're in the menopause. And again, in the menopause, get support. 
typically the menopause is, is, it can be the sandwich years for a lot of people. The children, the teenagers are growing up and becoming horrible. The parents are growing down and becoming horrible. And then you've got the changing landscape of your hormones as well. So this is the time to reach out for friendship, to reach out for professional help if your anxiety and depression, if that's starting to hit. Um, I mean, all of the things that I talk about in my toolkit become even more important. Relaxation techniques, breathing techniques, getting out into nature, practicing gratitude, practicing meditation, all of this will help with the menopause. Um, well, that's already answered one of the questions that was top of the list from Anne, I think it was. So please do, if you uh, haven't already posted a question you'd like to ask, please add it to the Q&A. And if you see another one you'd love to see answered, please vote, because I'm going to look at the ones that get the most upvotes. Um, and on that note, George has asked, what's your opinion on sleep supplements, such as CBD oil or magnesium, amino acids, etc.? Mm. Where are you at with what works and what doesn't? Yeah, um, I, I'm a great believer. I, I pop a magnesium, 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams of magnesium, magnesium citrate, before I turn my bedside light, light out. And it really helps with um, restless leg syndrome. Um, it really helps if you're doing a lot of training, doing a lot of exercise, good for menopause as well. So um, I love the magnesium. I love CBT, CBD products as well, the good CBD oil products for sleep. Again, I get sent lots of, uh, of merchandise and I, I've got quite a few products that I've trialed and they're, they're pretty good. Uh, I would say though, magnesium is a good one to have every night. Don't get over reliant on, on some of the CBD products because they can stop. Like a lot of things, you develop a, a kind of tolerance after a while, you know, but magnesium is certainly a really good one. And somebody mentioned grounding in nature. I'm going to go for a, You mentioned this yesterday in our, our, our preparation talk. I'm going to go for a walk with my dog after this. It's just 20 minutes. I've been known to go to the field and walk barefoot, 20 minutes barefoot and um grounding there's so much research behind getting barefoot onto, onto the soil particularly wet grass we've just had some some rain here in the UK so it's a perfect way to ground after being in front of the lights and the technology um yeah have I answered the question there? yeah you have answered the question yeah. thank you um Liam said not a question but just a big thank you to you both gratitude 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 and let's oh. maybe come back to that topic of gratitude in a moment but just wanted to share that um, Cheryl is asking an interesting question. We've seen quite a lot, I think, in the media recently about the power of napping. Um, I heard yes. one of the Michael Mosley's um, Just One Things about the power of the nap just today. But Cheryl's question is, do naps late in the day affect our nighttime sleep? Is there a cutoff yeah. time and how long should a nap be to not sort of ruin our evening sleep? Yeah, and someone said, I have to be really tired to nap. And actually, let me just dispel that myth, that particular myth. And that's, I don't know, I'm wondering if Carolyn is a perfectionist as well, because perfectionists will often say, I can't possibly nap, I haven't got time, but I have to be exhausted, then I'll nap. Okay, so there are many different types of naps. There are at least five different types of naps. The napping we're talking about here, and the one that I had this afternoon, is called a, uh, a power nap. So it's very specific. So listen up to this one. A power nap is anything up to 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes, no more than that, 10 to 20 minutes at some point between 2 and 4 p.m., no later than 4 p.m. So I had mine at 3. I was lying on an acupressure mat. It was about 20 odd minutes. And I wouldn't do that after four. After four, it will affect your sleep drive and your ability to fall asleep tonight. Now, there are longer naps because I noticed somebody said something about post um, COVID, uh, long COVID. Uh, longer naps, the replacement nap two or three times a week might be good for you. Again, at some point between two and 4 p.m., a replacement nap is up to 40 minutes, but no longer. And that one starts to take you into the sleep state. So a power nap is not sleeping. It's closing your eyes. It's doing that weird thing I was doing earlier. I love my left foot doing that. You're aware, you might be hearing noises, but your eyes are closed. You can be lying down. You're not getting into bed, pulling the duvet up to your, your eyes, you know, and sleeping for three hours. That's mm. sleeping, that's not napping. Something what someone once told me that I found really empowering when I was worrying about sleeping at night, someone said, well, just remember that even just being in your bed and being in a calm state, even if you're not yeah. actually asleep, it's still yeah. really good for you. And that to me was really liberating because it took away some of that pressure to need to be asleep and just thinking, Absolutely. if I've got in my head, well, I'm lying here, I'm, doing, I'm breathing, I'm calm. That's actually good, even if I'm not asleep. And that's some, actually paradoxically helped me fall asleep much more quickly. 
yeah. Um, and, and, and Anna, yes, uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation, can take you into a nap, and that's that's absolutely mm. fine as well. Um, but you're absolutely right. So there's something called paradox paradoxical insomnia, which is where we think we're not sleeping, but we are actually sleeping. And when I worked in the psychiatric clinic, um, sorry, the scratching noise is my dog trying to make a hole in the middle of the office. You can just ignore <laughs> that. Okay. Um, I used to work in a psychiatric clinic where the patients would, would, in the morning, they would say to the nurses, do you see what I mean? I'm not sleeping at all. But the nurses would have checked them during the night and they would have maybe prodded them and they were fast asleep. So sometimes we can think we're, we're awake because we're in a state of consciousness that feels awake, but it's not, it's asleep. It's more asleep than we think. So when you think about it, you know, if you read a book, and you go back the, ne the next day and you have to read the entire chapter again because you read the whole thing while you were asleep, but your eyes were open. So it's possible to sleep with your eyes open. It's possible to be asleep and think that you're awake. So when you wake up during the night, which we now know is normal, don't worry about it. Just think about resting. I have one client at the moment who I'm working with one-to-one. -one. I have banned the word sleep from his, direct, uh, from his dictionary. I said, you're not allowed to think about sleeping. Tonight, you're gonna go to bed and rest because he's such a perfectionist. Um, that he obsesses about his sleep. So you're only allowed to rest. Interestingly as well, the aura will measure your rest. I've had nights where I've thought all I've done is rested because I got woken up by the daughter, by my mother in South America, by the dog, whatever. I thought all I did last night was rested. And then I look at my data, sleep 91, you know? Mm, I, yeah, so I agree. I found that really helpful with the sleep tracker. But also another thing I found surprising was that when I went to bed consistently earlier, the quality of my sleep and the deep sleep and so on was just better, even though it might not have been any longer in bed. And that comes on to the next question that's been very highly upvoted here from Judy. Thank you, Judy. I know you've been to lots of these events. Please, can you tell us more about the importance of getting to bed, say, at 10 p.m.? And why is it that sleep before midnight is so good? Um, that's sort of drawing on that point. How, how would yeah. you respond to so that? So again, yeah, it goes back to this thing of this, you know, this perfect dance cacophony of hormones and neuropeptides that comes into play as the light levels drop below about 200 lux. So it's all linked to uh, periods of light and dark in, in, in the world around us, in nature. And so nature has set us up to get our most enriching phase of sleep pre-midnight, or at least the most powerful setup for sleep before midnight when your, your sleep drive is at its maximum. Sleep drive is that you sort of build up your sleep drive throughout the day and the hormone levels are at their peak before midnight. So you go to bed, you get that 90 minute hit of sleep. So the chances are if you're woken during the night by a hairy mammoth or saber toothed tiger, you've had that 90 minute pre-midnight pre phase of sleep. Now emerging research from places like Imperial College, um, University of Glasgow is showing that this pre-midnight sleep is really important for reducing risk of developing neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's also really more recent research has shown it reduces uh, coronary risk, reduce the risk of developing strokes and high blood pressure and heart attacks if you're getting to sleep before midnight. It can also reduce that truncal thickening, you know, fat around the middle, which is what increases if you're not getting enough of the right type of sleep, you start producing more cortisol, and laying down more internal fat around the middle. So that sort of links nicely to, um, well, actually another part of Judy's question and also a question from Maya about routines. So the, the follow on to Judy from Judy was, do you have any good ideas for a night routine, especially if you're trying to get to bed at let's say 10 o'clock? Mm -hmm. and, and Maya's made the point about how do you stick to a good bedtime when you maybe, especially if you need, you feel the need to make the most of your evening after work. She says she sudden, suddenly gets mm -hmm. a bunch of energy sometimes at 10 p.m. and wants to stay up. So what about yeah. routines? Yeah, and I mean, that, that energy, you can get a little energy peak, you know, when, when I'm writing books and I'm on a deadline, I'll sometimes surf that, that rise in mental energy and I'll stay up and write and I'll go to bed later or I'll wake up at three in the morning and I'll do a bit of writing there. So we can play around with the, the peaks and troughs of our energy. Um, I would say that the first thing, and I really hear that point about, you know, you're working long hours, you've got a young family and they've got them to bed and you just want a life for yourself and you want to stay up. But just look at the data. When I say data, I mean, look at what's happening in your life. What, how are you feeling when you wake up in the morning? What are your energy levels like? Are you living your best life? Are you thriving? Are you feeling happy? Have you got the energy to do the things that you really want to do, to exercise, to have that social life? whatever it is and, and if it's not if you're not 
then maybe you do need to sacrifice some things, at least 80% of the time, an 80-20 rule, which means, you know, sometimes I'm watching a catch-up, something on catch-up, and I think, I really want to watch this next episode. And I go, well, no, I'm not going to, because I love my clients enough to go to bed and get good sleep and wake up with great energy to do the exercise that gives me the energy to do this kind of thing. So we've got to look at what's working. What, and I think it comes down to values, Mark. You know, mm. what's important in your life? What do you value? What matters what you, most. Yeah, I've got my top five values in front of me. I want to live a life of ease and grace. I want to have fun. I want to be of service. That means I want to get to bed early so that I can do those things, especially at my age. You know? I love that. I love how you're linking sleep back to kind of almost the whole mission in life. Yeah. And, but important. also it's about the the habits we build into the whole of our lives. And one of the things I love about this community not only the values that people share is, is the wisdom that's built in, I think, to many people, even although lots of us are struggling with these things. So I wonder if we could just take a very quick pause and turn to all of you in the community and just say, you've heard some fantastic tips from our sleep expert, Dr. Narina here, but what are some of the things that you find really help you to feel refreshed, to feel rested, to feel like you can get to sleep? Maybe just share a few of the things that, that you find help, because uh, I, I always find that really inspiring. So I'm seeing yoga exercise meditation cool linen herbal tea cuddling cuddling latitude, a tidy bedroom relaxation long walks fresh air uh sleep tea podcast breathing being outside in the day bedtime story opening the windows wow what a lot what, what are you what are you seeing in this list Marina? i'm seeing lots of amazing stuff in there uh, the people are on the orasms as well we've got orasms in there but we've got some really good really good stuff of uh, doodling yeah absolutely and um, somebody asked about tv earlier on four seven eight breathing box breathing you know foot massage is amazing you can use coconut oil ayurvedic oils and things like that but you know value yourself enough to have some kind of wind, wind down routine the thing that i do in the evenings as well is i always turn the light levels down i don't watch tv in bed i don't recommend that but watching tv in another room turn the light levels down um dog beside me living my best life might be a little piece of chocolate in there you know but the, the wind down routine the phone's in another room I would also say it's not just your routine in the evening, but from the minute you wake up in the morning, every choice you're making throughout the day, 1,440 minutes, you're preparing yourself for how you're going to sleep at night because all of those choices land in your nervous system. So from the minute you wake up, make choices that will take you closer to getting a good night's sleep. Can I recommend a really simple technique for first thing in the morning? Please do, yeah. OK, you wake up first thing in the morning and you're thinking, OK, what shall I do? Should I be journaling? Should I do the gratitude thing? Should I should I be doing TM? Should I be doing headstands? What, what should I do? Keep it simple. When you wake up, don't look at your phone first thing. Don't look at your phone. Keep your eyes closed. And follow three exhalations, not three breaths, three exhalations, three. So you breathe in, you breathe out, you follow that breath and you use the word out to follow the breath. You breathe in, out. you breathe in, another out. And you listen, listen to the speed of your thoughts. Listen to what your mind is telling you. And listen to whether you actually need to take a deeper breath. And listen to whether those anxiety levels are saying, right, actually, I'm not gonna have that coffee. I'm not gonna go straight into my inbox. I'm actually gonna eat breakfast this morning, or I'm gonna go for 10 minutes work uh, walk first before I start my day but start your day from inside out rather than outside in oh I love that that's very powerful it's good isn't it someone should write yeah, a book about that I have yeah, indeed can I just come <laughs> to a really important point that Andy's raising here because of course hmm. um yeah some of these things are really within our control but many people are dealing with life challenges that that are outside their control in some cases yeah, and so Andy's question is about cool. Well, how can you sleep when you're dealing with chronic pain, which is disturbing your sleep due to a you know, lack of comfort? And so there are people obviously dealing with severe illness, chronic pain and so on. So can you share some tips for what to do when you know you are just in pain, but trying to sleep? Yeah. So things like breath work, because I've, I've done a lot of work around this, you know, women recovering from breast cancer and that sort of thing. So following your breath, practicing some form of meditation, keeping a gratitude journal, before you go to bed, you know, the mind, the, the emotional brain and the pain center are in this, they're at the same place, it's the same location. So if your emotions are raging and you're not feeling happy, 
you're going to feel more pain. You know, if you if you bang your toe on the way out of your office, it's going to hurt more than if you bang your toe on the first day of a holiday. You're in a Caribbean island in a nice swanky hotel or something. You know, you feel more pain when you're stressed. So manage your stress levels. Do as much as you can to feel safe, to calm yourself so that the pain isn't as bad. I'd also recommend on a practical note, things like um, Epsom salt baths, which are really good for sleep as well, but also good for pain management and for calming the nervous system. So steep a bath of water, put two cupfuls of bicarbonate of soda or Epsom salts, soak in it for 20 minutes or so. And that can be very good for pain relief. I also um, use an acupressure mat which, you know, because I do quite a bit of sport and climbing, if I pull the muscle or something like that, lying with bare skin on the acupressure mat in the bed can really help to stimulate those uh, pain relieving pathways. So that can that can really help as well. EFT mm. tapping, brilliant. Tri um, acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy. Investigate. Yeah, I've, I've been, it's been lovely to see all those suggestions in the chat and I know yeah, that you've experimented with, with a range of things. Um, I wanted to just combine together three last questions and then I, I've got something I'd love us to do before we, we wrap up together. But um, these last three all relate to that point about waking in the night. So Yukta, first of all, says they tend to wake up in the middle of the night and then can't fall asleep. We've talked a little bit about that. Uh, Mary has, has talked about... Um, is there something that they might do when they can't sleep? Is it useful to get up if you can't sleep or, or to read uh, or to stop and have a cup of chamomile tea? But then Ruth's raised the point, which is my particular bugbear. I wake up needing the loo at least once a night, often many more times than once. And Ruth just said, any advice on reducing loo visits? So I think all of these fit under this theme of when we're getting woken in the night for whatever reason, mm. um, what can we do to reduce that or respond as wisely to it as we can? Yeah, and so nocturnal enuresis, the peeing during the night, is normal. It's normal to go to the loo. So the first thing is not to be anxious about it. And as I've said, adult nappy, Clifford, really. Uh, sorry. Um, so not checking the time and all that the, the stuff I've said and trying to stay restful and then coming back and using the exercise to put yourself back to sleep. But, you know, I've talked about hydration as one of my non-negotiables. So what you don't want to now do after this session is go and drink two to three liters of water. I know it sounds obvious, but don't just build up to drinking um, increasing your hydration levels over a period of time, and then your bladder will develop strength so that you could, your retention uh, is better, you know, but don't worry, if you have to get up and go to the loo, do it. Now, if you're, if you're waking up during the night and it's happening repeatedly over a period of time, if there's some value sometimes in getting up and getting yourself a chamomile tea or going and reading a book or even getting a cracker or something like that, um, with some butter or something just to, and then resetting your sleep cycle again and again not checking the time coming back to bed again using the breathing but try not to get into the habit of always getting up to read a book because then you start to bed in that habit and maybe you know? actually they could try that fantastic technique of loving the foot and the shin exactly and, yeah but, but actually I mean I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of lots of us here who really benefited from that very practical example I know you've got a range of meditation so I wondered in our last few minutes together whether you might share another little mini meditation that we could try Narina I think you talked about gratitude and other things what, what what comes to mind for you yeah I mean I this is another one that I use as a gratitude meditation um you know the pandemic has brought sadness and loneliness and loss for many of us myself included and there were times when I would wake up worrying about my mother or my daughter or whatever and my mother would say to me she lived in South America don't worry about me pray for me and gratitude is a form of prayer so it's a beautiful technique is before you go to bed you know if you don't want to journal just think about your day go backwards through your day and just think about every little thing that's happened in your day that you could be grateful for and just in your mind just say thank you and, and sometimes I another form of gratitude is get into bed and love your bed. So I go into bed and I sometimes go, oh, I just love my bed. And I just hug my pillow and I just move around and make some sighing noises. Um, and uh, it might sound odd, but it really is, it's, it's, it's just saying thank you for this safe space that I'm in, given that some of the world is not entirely safe at the moment. And we have this. So I would call this meditating in the chat, which I rather yes, like. Yes, I've heard this called meditation <laughs> as well. Um, moving around, meditation, sighing. Sighing is an amazing, if you ever listen to your animals, my dog does it. She sighs. She actually says, she goes, Foof. 
she goes like that and it, it switches on the parasympathetic nervous system when you sigh and making your sigh as long as possible now when you wake up during the night go back into that gratitude space again who are you grateful for if you're worrying about someone who's thousands of miles away imagine sending them love imagine hugging them imagine hugging your grumpy obnoxious teenager imagine saying i love you so much i love you so much it, it works like magic you'd be surprised it works with I'm, my i'm getting a really heartwarming feeling hearing this this and it's a lovely way to close so on that theme of gratitude i wanted to express huge gratitude First of all, to the audience for being here and for participating and for everyone who made a small donation to Action for Happiness as part of being part of this event and this community and helping us put these on. But particularly gratitude to you, Dr. Narina. It's been Thank really you. insightful. And as Anna has just put in the chat, she says, I thought this would be the same old tips that I've heard a million times before, but it's been so refreshing and useful. And I, I completely agree with that. Thank you, Anna. And Narina, thank you for your time and and what we're going to do tomorrow people have been asking can they see this again so we're going to share with everyone who signed up for this event a video of this conversation and also links to your fantastic books and website so yeah. we'll be helping to i hope spread the word about some of your wisdom much of which is very freely available online but i, I wanted to hand back to you and say is there any final sort of thoughts you'd like to leave us with uh well i feel incredibly grateful for this for this session and i i just want to say to everyone allow yourself to be happy because we're living in a world at the moment where we can feel so much guilt and shame about it when there are people who aren't so 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 happy at the moment but i think let's start a different contagion because when we are happy it, we put ourselves in a better a better place to go out and be kind to other people make other people laugh and 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 it's catching it's contagious and i think we need that in the world at the moment because it's been a tough few years so let's tell ourselves we deserve to be happy very well said what a perfect note to end on Noina. thank you so much keep up the inspiring work and, and look forward to carrying on the conversation thank you so much mark it's been such a uh, privilege to be here today thank you sleep well i will <laughs> thank you sleep well everyone thank you very much